part of the overture to Mozart's Magic Flute in a new recording from Harmonium Mundi, conducted by René Jacobs with the Académie für Alte Musik Berlin. And that's one of the operas that has made it through to the last round of the Gramophone Awards this year. I'm joined by Richard Fairman, who writes for Gramophone as well as the Financial Times, to talk about the top three. Now, Richard, looking at the this trio of operas, if we turn the clock back, I don't know, 15, 20 years, we'd probably be looking at three sets with the biggest stars of today, most likely recorded in the studio, and almost certainly recorded by a major company. Here we have uh, two, well actually three independent companies. One is uh, an orchestra-owned label, LSO Live, that's Verdi's Otello. We have the Magic Flute from Harmonia Mundi, a studio recording, though a co-production with German radio, and Rossina's Emioni from Opera Rara, independent company that focuses on opera primarily and and the vocal art um do you think what's your sort of take on the way things have changed to me opera has become much more of a live um event rather than uh, an event in the recording studio and i i think we see that again here with with two out of the three being uh, recordings which emanate from live performances in one way or on another uh i personally think that's quite a good thing I, I love opera live in the opera house and I am excited by some of these performances that have that live feeling when, when they arrive as recordings at gramophone headquarters. And actually recording an opera, as it were, in, li- in live conditions but not staged, in other words, in a concert um, environment, is actually the best of both worlds because you get, you get the atmosphere of a live performance but you don't get everyone charging all over the stage. That's true, and, and I think the interesting thing is you have it in all three of these. I was lucky enough to be at the live performance of the Rossini in the Royal Festival Hall and one of the joys I have is that this particular set captures that so excitingly. Um, we, it's not an easy thing to sing for any of the singers, uh, and yet here they are all at their peak because they've just done it live on, in, on the concert platform, uh, and that comes across in a way that makes Rossini really live, I think. Now, Rossini's Hermione sort of sits in that sort of hinterland between um, the regularly performed Rossini's and the ones that are only being discovered. I mean, I think I heard it at, at Glyndebourne many, many years ago, and it just, it's increasingly, it's sort of popping up. I mean, what's your take on it as a work? Indeed, I was at Glyndebourne as well, and I think there is still the DVD of With the, the wonderful Antonacci in Indeed. the Indeed, I mean, it was a wonderful production, that, and I remember how the, the, back, the hairs on the back of my head were tingling as, as we hit, went through that final scene. It does have some really good music in it. It's perhaps not the equal of some of the later opera series, like William Tell, which we had at the proms last week. Uh, but it does have good music, and it has some wonderful parts for all the singers, especially the, the tenors, really killing things, very well sung here. Now, the title role on this recording is taken by Carmen Genatasio. Um, how, does, how does she shape up? She was exciting in the hall. That's the first thing. Um, she It's quite high for it, for her, some of it, um, but she has the Italian f- uh, style and the Italian language at her fingertips, and she knows how to make words and music fuse into one and come alive. I always get the feeling from these um, opera rara productions that they go to a lot of trouble to get singers who really do mould into the style. It's not one of these kind of, you know, multinational, you know, fly in, do your thing, and if it doesn't sound too Italian, it doesn't matter. This this is really rehearsed in great detail, in the in the kind of old-fashioned way. It, it is, and you have some specialists here. You have Colin Lee, who's making a name for himself in the very high tenor repertoire of Rossini and others. Uh, and I believe Paul Nyland was one of the tenors at Kleinborn, so he also knows the style and this opera very well. Um, it, you don't necessarily need just the biggest names. You need people who know how to make the music come alive. <laughs> Let's move to um, 
the Mozart Zauberflöte. Now, this is part of the series that René Jacobs is recording for Harmonia Mundi of Mozart Operas. The Marriage of Figaro uh, got the recording of the year some years ago. Now, this is this is not your average, everyday uh, Zauberflöte. I mean, if you put it on and you knew the flute pretty well, you'd be, be in for a number of shocks, I think. I, I think you would. Um, first of all, you have an awful lot of noises off. Uh, you have dripping water in Act 2, you have birds twittering through Act 1, uh, you have a, all the dialogue, of course, uh, performed with a tremendous amount of spontaneity, uh, and you have René Jacobs really at his most eccentric, I think, even more than in the Figaro or the Clemente de Tito from a couple of years ago. Uh, and so you, you certainly are going to come away with a few surprises. Now... As with uh, other recordings in this series, he tends to go for younger voices. He's very much led by the fact that a lot of Mozart's first casts were very young. I mean, some teenagers, others in their very early 20s. I suppose in this set, um, perhaps the most startling one is, is maybe the Sarastro, which is much, much lighter voice than, than we're used to the sort of sepulchral kind of Kurt Moll type voice. Well, as it happens, I was doing research on this last year, more in co the context of Don Giovanni, um, where, of course, almost all the singers were below the age of 24, which really makes you think. Uh, these were the equivalent of singers who were at opera school or music college today. Uh, I personally rather enjoy it. I enjoyed all the singers uh, in this Salba Flirta. Um, and we also need to remember that the theatres that the performances would have been in in Mozart's day would have been so much smaller and the orchestra would have been smaller and it would have played with less volume. And René Jacobs, in this sense, is an authenticist of a different kind, perhaps to some that we've had in the past, like John Elliott Gardner or Harnham Court or Hogwood, uh, in that he's, he's feeling himself back to how it might really have been in a live performance of Mozart's time. Uh, and that, I think, is, is something he's captured here in the very pantomime elements that he's putting across. I was going to say, I was going to actually use that very word, pantomime. I mean, you do really get a sense of, of theatre in this. I mean, with the yards of dialogue, which, as you say, is done incredibly well, and the sound effects, and it just it whips along. And uh, what, what's your take on Jacobs' continuo? I know that upsets a lot of people because it is very, very f fancy, isn't it? It is. Uh, I mean, as far as I'm aware, there is no evidence uh, as to what the continue might have been like, how much they would have played. Uh, I was irritated, I have to say, by the snatches of other bits of Mozart operas coming in. I felt that was a very 21st century knowing, uh, telling effect, but uh, which I very much doubt they would have done at the time. Uh, however, uh, the strength and, if you like, the weakness of this set to me is the same. It is the spontaneity of it. You will have no other performance of Zauber Flirter in your collection which is as live uh, and as spontaneous as this, and yet do you really want to hear it necessarily more than once? It's, it's a performance that happens once and perhaps not more times over. I mean, sing, singling out some of the singers in this, I mean, I, was, I must say I was absolutely knocked out by the Tamino Daniel Baylor. He's a lovely singer. Um, he's very sensitive. Um, he works very well with Pamina, Marlis Peterson. Uh, they're a lovely duo. Uh, I think nobody would fail to enjoy what they do. Now let's move on to the third set. Now this is Verdi's Otello, an LSO live recording which finds Sir Colin Davis with his London Symphony Orchestra and chorus. A recording of Otello doesn't necessarily stand or fall by its Otello, but it does need a very, very strong singer. I mean, what's your take on this, Simon O'Neill? Well, one of the interests for me is that I grew up with Colin Davis conducting this uh, opera at the Royal Opera House. Uh, and in those days, of course, he was working by and large with John Vickers, who I saw sing Otello many, many times. Um, we have a plus and a minus here. The plus is that we have the London Symphony Orchestra playing so fantastically uh, and, of course, not hidden down in a pitch, so the sound is very live and very full of colours. 
uh, and yet we don't have perhaps those very famous stars that we might have seen in the Opera House. And Simon O'Neill, uh, who I believe was singing this role, uh, if not for the first time, at least quite early on, naturally doesn't have the, the great authority that a John Vickers would have in the role. Uh, but it is a very promising voice. It, it's, he has no trouble with the, with the technique or the notes at all. Uh, it's clarion clear. Um, and it forms part of an overall conception rather than being the dominating feature of the performance. And my take on this is that uh, this is very much the Iago's set. I mean, Gerald Finlay is on terrific form. Uh, I'm a great Gerald Finlay fan. Um, he can do almost no wrong in my book. And uh, this is a very subtle and very well thought and, of course, exceedingly well sung Iago. And what about Anne Schwanewilms, a German Desdemona? Indeed, slightly different from usual, but very sympathetic. We know that Verdi wanted Desdemona to be uh, to, to win your heart and simply to sing beautifully, I believe, is what he said in one of his letters. Uh, she does sing beautifully. Uh, I th she's perhaps not a Renee Fleming in terms of the size of the voice, but she still has her own personality to bring to it. Now, of all the sort of mature Verdi operas, I mean, Otello seems to be the most sort of symphonic and actually it seems to benefit enormously well from, you know, as, as you said, having the orchestra not in the pit, but very much there in front of you. Yes, um, as it happens, I didn't attend the live performance of the Otello, but I can imagine that in the hall, the, the orchestra would have sounded very big. Uh, what we have here, very carefully balanced, uh, uh, is a performance in which the orchestra is totally, totally alive, and yet the singers are still very prominent. Oh. 